So we're doing a, a trip round the cardinal points of the compass, north, south, east and west, and then into the centre to Glen Turret, and collecting whisky on the way to make a blend called Journey's Blend. Triumph and Enfield have lent us two bikes to do it on. The Triumph is just smooth as very, very impressed. Um, plenty of poke and quite very happy with it. It's going to be hard giving it back, actually. Do you know, I won't, I won't hear a bad word said about this bike. It looks fantastic, it sounds fantastic, and on the right roads, it rides like a dream. Should take us five days, about a thousand miles. We meet up with Tom Morton from the BBC tonight in Fort William, so he'll be joining us for the rest of the trip. And uh, yeah, when we get to the end, John Ramsey from Edrington will be there and we'll, we'll put what we've collected and blend it together. Okay, so we're at Highland Park, so it's the first stop on the on the, uh, the five distillery tour. And uh, we've got four samples of whiskey uh, to make up the final blend, and this, this is the selection process. Lead the witness, I man. It's up to you to pick the cast. So, uh, it's, uh, but I have, I have a definite view on this. Yeah. In fact, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> <laughs> I was just starting to like it as well. Oh, what are you expecting? Yeah. I'm thinking, like, oh, you're right. It's absolutely. Different. So you're gonna probably want a bit of body. Yeah, I was thinking sort of HP is the backbone of things. Yeah. If you're getting a big punch from a three-year-old earlier, then you're gonna want a bit of maturity and a bit of body, and that mm -hmm. says that for me. Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't really explain why, but I think this third one's better than the the taste of the other two. And do you think it's you know is it the sensation on the palate that's a little bit different, or is it? I think it's the sensation on the palate is the best way of putting it. Yeah, I think it's gonna be number three for me, definitely. You sure? Yeah, um, definitely number three for me. A bit of a decision then, gentlemen. Hallelujah. So we'll oh, have a winner. Last number two. That's number two. Keep that. Yeah. So that's for you. Thank you very much, sir. See you after John for me. We'll do it when we see it. Good luck. Good luck with the rest of your journey. Good luck. Thanks very much. Thank you. Got the dram, got the whiskey, um, got the ticket, got the bike, got the mate and snapper. So let's let's hit the road and go to uh, Stennis and see some stones. Good to meet you. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank yeah. you. Cheers again, mate. Take your time. Well, with your glove on. <laughs> see you guys. It's a nightmare. <laughs> You'll never make it. <laughs> There's no chance. Best of luck to him, though. Best of luck. Ah, oh, well. We're at the Stones at Stennis, um, so Ken's going to tell us a little bit about it. So it's a Neolithic ritual stone circle. You've got, there's five stones surviving there. There was originally 12. They're all about five and a half metres, five and a half metres tall. And the whole monument was originally surrounded by a ditch uh, and a bank, which you can just see the remnants of over by that sheep. And uh, it's about 5,000 years old, something like that, which makes it Neolithic. So late Stone Age, it's a fantastic site. It's, the stones here are much bigger than the ones at Brodgar, but there's more surviving stones and there are more stones at Brodgar, but it's a similar date. And 
if I remember correctly, there's a settlement just over just over the Bray on the other side there that would have uh, that's probably associated with the with this site as well. I can't get enough of the archaeology here. I love it. <laughs> it's no, it's a fantastic place. You can roughly date graffiti by the font they use because people write in the write carve in the style of the writing of the time. Yeah. And if you look at some of the, the graffiti in Norwich Cathedral that's 17th century, it looks like 17th century writing. It's kind of but it's copper plate and scroll. Yeah, and it's just a, but it's just car it's just carved in. So yeah. it's fascinating stuff. But here, there's somebody's carved a load of runes in, oh, and now yeah. they've got to be modern. Yeah. Because they're well, they're you know they're. They're very short and they're they're not at all like the, the maze how runes and they're too fresh. I mean there's really sharp edges on that, so. The odd thing is that obvious obviously it's terrible that people carve their names into these things, but then once they've done it, you've got this kind of extra record that I think I secretly think is quite nice. Ken, have you have you been here before? I, I deny all knowledge. <laughs> yeah, it could well. be career limiting if I did. <laughs> it could actually. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's not you. Where, where are we going to? Right. So here we are on the ferry, leaving Orkney, back to the mainland, yep. and uh, passing Hoy. Yeah, and some of the some of the highest sea cliffs in Europe. Yeah, and bird population, I believe, which, quite big. Which is declining at the uh, at the moment. Yeah. But just behind me. There's, you can see the sea, the sea stack of the old man of Hoy. Yeah, and how does that happen though? How does it get there? Well, basically, as you get a bit of a bit of promontory of rock, the water comes behind the roads behind it, and you, it forms an archway. Yeah. And so you get the the arch cross, and that's that's very weak. And so the, when the arch collapses, you're left with the, the two sides of the arch. One side's the cliff, the other side's the the, the stack, the, stack. the old man of Hoy. Yeah. And you can't. Looking at it from the from this angle, you don't get an idea of just how big it actually is. If you go to the cliff just above it and look down, then it's terrifyingly huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know I don't know what it is in feet, but as you stand at the top, you get all the fulmers catch all the thermals off the cliff, and they just float about two meters away from you, just looking at you, thinking, "What are they doing?" You can see all the horizontal lines in it. The guillemots have evolved to to nest on those, and their egg is shaped kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. So that if it starts to roll, it rolls in an arc and doesn't just roll off the edge. Isn't nature clever? <laughs> <laughs> Evolution, mate. <laughs> Evolution, yeah, yeah. That's why probably we're going to be bred out eventually. Glenmorangie <laughs> yeah. won uh, Innovator of the Year twice, so we thought we'd yeah, be rude not not to stop him for lunch as we pass. So we're going to meet up with Annabelle Meikle, who's just appearing around the corner, and hopefully she'll have some sandwiches on for us. Have. Catch me on camera, Richie. Look at you, biker boy. How you doing? I'm good well. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Ken, I'm Ken. Annabelle. Nice to meet you. God, look at fantastic bikes. Yeah. God, they're really amazing, aren't they? Yeah. I'll give you the keys if you want. I, I, I would love to sit on the back. I would be more <laughs> terrified. Sure. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, we're really immensely proud of our still house. We did have eight stills in here, four pairs, and we've just increased it to 12, which gives us a huge capacity to distill spirit. We're up to six million litres of spirit a year, so there's going to be a lot of Glenmorangie uh, in a few years time. So very, very tall necks, the tallest necks um, of all the distilleries in Scotland. And this gives us a very clean, a very delicate, a fruity floral new make spirit because there's lots of contact with the copper and the copper acts as a purifier. So we're getting a really, really beautiful new make spirit. What happened was we shipped them in uh, on a huge lever which ran along the ceiling bit by bit so we brought in the base of the stills and then the necks 
and then they were all welded into place. So it was a few heart-stopping moments while that was going on, but it looks fantastic now and the boys have got it operating brilliantly. So a warm day to be in a still house. <laughs> Well, we've come to visit an invisible castle and to get some photos of the invisible castle that we can't see. So we've come up with a compromise plan that only involves breaking the law a tiny bit uh, with just to get some shots of the bikes across the lock that direction. The bikes across the, the lock that, that direction. But uh, Hysteric Scotland have very nicely put a tree just to hide the castle in case that, in case that in obscures case any shot. Yeah, see, exactly. Well, we didn't want it spoiling the shot, really, no, a pile of stones. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favourite castley castles, and it's just down there on this promontory. Lovely views, but you can't see it. So, yeah, we're going to have to do something else. There we go. And we'd best do it quickly, because I can hear the coppers in the background. Yeah, I don't think they're chasing us, mate. Not yet. Urquhart Castle is one of the best looking castles in Scotland after probably Aileen Donnan. It's just, you know, it's, it's where it sits, the view. Historic Scotland have planted all these wonderful trees, so you can't see the castle properly and it's closed, so we're not actually allowed down there. This is the only spot that we can get a view of the castle from. Yeah, and you, we're not supposed to be on the wall either, really, but you know. And the view, we'll go back to the view, the real reason why we're here. Yeah. Oh, oh, and the sun's come out as well. See, God shines on the lawbreakers of this world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, occasionally. Although if somebody did come and ask us to move, we probably would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's breaking the law and there's being unpleasant. There's well, two yeah, different that's things. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. true. Well, we should probably hit the road again. Splendid. Maybe. Let's go.